and Joan, we're ready to begin. You are muted at the moment. Joan, you have to unmute yourself. Are we ready? Welcome to Scottsdale's annual Founders Day celebration. I'm Joan Fadala, community historian, and I'm a very proud member of the Winfield Scott Fan Club. You know, for years we've celebrated when Chaplain Winfield Scott, our town's namesake, uh, with an outdoor celebration and birthday party in front of Scottsdale's beloved Little Red Schoolhouse, the Scottsdale Historical Society Museum. And we've had that party complete with an old fashioned picnic, lemonade and birthday cake. But this year, 2021, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're still saluting our founder, uh, Winfield Scott and his amazing wife, Helen, uh, but in a safer, more virtual way. Uh, and I hope that you all will enjoy this look back at our amazing founder's life and that of his wife. You know, we observe Founders Day um, on this particular day uh, because this is the actual birth date of uh, U.S. Army Chaplain Major Winfield Scott, who was born February 26th, 1837. In other words, 184 years ago today. So uh, our own mayor, uh, David Ortega has officially proclaimed this to be Winfield Scott Day in Scottsdale. And uh, just like uh, Winfield Scott, Mayor Ortega has been a great promoter of Scottsdale history and this particular event today and has been inviting Scottsdale uh, citizens to be a part of this uh, through uh, several promotions that Mayor Ortega has done on the city's Facebook page. And speaking of that, uh, Mayor Ortega also invited you to participate in a two question trivia contest for which he has offered prizes of movie passes. So we hope that you have had an opportunity to participate in the Winfield Scott Trivia Contest because there are prizes. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to acknowledge several individuals and groups who over the many years have supported this annual event where we celebrate Scottsdale's founder and namesake. You know, decades ago, a group uh, was formed calling itself the Friends of Winfield Scott under the great leadership of the late uh, Roberta Pilcher. Uh, she lovingly supported this and hosted this event uh, for many, many years. And then just a few years before her passing, uh, she passed the torch on to Joanne Handley of the Historical Society and myself. Uh, over the years, though, there have been many others who have supported uh, promoting this and uh, staging this event, including Joanne Handley's sisters and friends, as well as members of the city's community services division. And I wanna give a special thanks to the Winfield Scott chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, who over the last several years have provided the birthday cake and lemonade that we've had when we were able to meet in person. And really from all of the community service projects that our Winfield Scott DAR chapter has done over their many years, they are following a wonderful tradition that Winfield and Helen Scott started many years ago of service to the community. 
I also certainly want to thank the many members and volunteers of the Scottsdale Historical Society, led by their president, Steve Randall. They've been keeping the stories of Winfield Scott alive all these years and also really lovingly promoting and preserving Scottsdale history. And really, they got their start in 1968 when the very schoolhouse where their museum is now was threatened to be torn down. And what a pity, because it was actually dedicated on Winfield Scott's birthday, February 26th in 1910. And that was one of the last really big public events in Scottsdale that he attended before his passing in later in 1910. So now let's celebrate the life and legacy of our founder, Chaplain Winfield Scott and his wife, Helen. And thanks to being virtual this year, instead of at an outdoor ceremony, we have the benefit of being able to enjoy some of those wonderful historic photos of the Scots and early Scottsdale. So our first speaker is the well-known City of Scottsdale citizen advisor, Bruce Wall, who is a storyteller extraordinaire. So Bruce, take it away. Thank you, Joan. Well, welcome everybody. Let me just do something real quick. And that is the trivia questions that we're gonna to have today. The first one is what cities are named after Winfield Scott? You'll hear the answer when I do this. And then how much did Winfield Scott pay for his land in 1882? You'll probably hear that during Joan's presentation. If you put in your, uh, your answer into the Q&A section, we will take that to draw people and have our presentation and give away the prizes that were so nicely donated by Mayor Ortega. And there's some movie passes that don't have an expiration date. So let's begin Winfield Scott before Scottsdale. Winfield Scott was born in West Novi, Michigan in 1837. And when he was nine years old, his family moved to New York. This photo is of the Farmer Village School in New York where he received his primary education. Winfield Scott attended college at the University of Rochester, graduating in 1859, and went on to the Rochester Theological Seminar, Seminary. And while there, he met Helen Louise Brown, who was a school teacher. Here's a portrait of Helen Louise Brown. They were married on July 11th, 1861, and shortly after their marriage, they moved to Farmer Village, New York, where the Seneca Baptist Association licensed him as a Baptist minister. When the Civil War broke out, Scott was commissioned as a captain for the 126th Division of the New York Volunteer Infantry. He served as an officer, not as a chaplain, and was called the Fighting Parson. He fought and was injured in several battles, including the Battle of Harper's Ferry and defending Pickett's Charge. Scott was injured severely in the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. Doctors doing triage thought that he would not survive the wound to his thigh and he had to insist to be treated. Later, Helen Scott received word of his dire circumstance that her husband was in and she requested permission to go and nurse him back to health. She made it as far as Washington DC where she was refused. And she asked for a personal meeting with President Abraham Lincoln to appeal her case. He gave her an interview and she won President Lincoln's support. She did in fact nurse Winfield back to health. After the Civil War, Winfield Scott was a pastor of a Baptist church in Leavenworth, Kansas uh, from 1865 to 1870. The picture on the left shows the church and on the right is an interior shot showing the altar and organ. While serving as a pastor in Kansas, they named a town after him called Winfield, Kansas, after he built a church for the new community. Today, it's a city of 12,000 and the county seat. Winfield Scott returned to the army and serving as a captain, but this time as an army chaplain. This is a picture of when he was stationed at Fort Canby, Washington. What I really like about this picture, you see this is the guardhouse. So if you got locked up in the stockade, you were on the ground floor and you see the soldier standing there. But Winfield Scott used the second floor as um, his, for where his church chapel was. 
So even if you got into trouble on a Saturday night and you got drunk and you got thrown in the stockade, you still heard the sermon the next morning from Winfield Scott from his voice. And he was assigned to Angel Island, California between 1885 and 1889. And in 1888, the Phoenix Chapter or Phoenix Chamber of Commerce invited Winfield Scott to see the Salt River Valley in hopes that he would be an influencer to encourage and inspire Civil War veterans and military families to move to Phoenix. He encouraged many veterans in all of his preaching and travels to the Grand Army of the Republic reunions. How lucky we are that he decided to homestead on land that would become Scottsdale. This is not the end, this is just the beginning of this story. So I'm going to turn off my screen and we're gonna have Joan continue from here. Joan, I believe you're muted. Jonah, I think you're still muted. You can try pressing the space bar. Got it. There you okay. go. Okay, we're, we're on now, sorry. <laughs> oh, technology, right? Something Winfield Scott didn't have to worry about. So let's begin by talking a little bit about Winfield Scott uh, as he arrived here um, in the Scottsdale area. Uh, as Bruce said, he had been invited to uh, look over the Salt River Valley in early 1888, while he was still assigned to Angel Island as a chaplain. Well, he was so impressed with what they were showing him that he went back to Angel Island, talked it over with his wife, Helen, and they decided on their meager army salary that they would uh, like to homestead land uh, for a future uh, second career here in Scottsdale as farmers and ranchers. So uh, if I could have the next slide, please that on July 2nd, 1888, uh, here's the actual homestead document filed under the Desert Lands Act that on, again, July 2nd, 1888, they paid $2.50 an acre for a section of land, which was uh, over 600 acres at the corner of what we now know as Scottsdale and Indian School Roads. In fact, there, if you can imagine how valuable that property is today, it was Indian School's road to the south, Scottsdale Road to the west, Chaparral to the north, and Hayden to the east. And can you imagine $2.50 an acre? And of course, this was uh, as the first real homestead in Scottsdale. It was made uh, possible because just a few years earlier in 1885, the Arizona Canal had been completed by another Civil War veteran, W.J. Murphy, allowing water to then be able to irrigate crops for farming in Scottsdale. Well, since Winfield was still on active duty as a chaplain in the army, he got his brother George to actually live on the land and he and Winfield, when Winfield could take leave from the army, would uh, actually then start planting the crops uh, that they uh, would raise on the, the farm and ranch there. So as the next photo shows, this uh, was a very, uh, very simple uh, home that uh, he built for he and Helen. Uh, it was what they would call a tent home. You can see the canvas flaps that were used for some of the windows and the brush ramadas, where sometimes they slept outside on sleeping porches and also did a lot of their cooking outside. 
But as the next photo shows, the main occupation during the time that, uh, that he uh, had his brother for the first couple of years do the ranch. And then when, he, when Winfield Scott uh, retired from the army and he and Helen moved here full time in 1883, they were uh, quite successful in raising, uh, uh, I can't even believe how many crops they, they raised. Uh, he was known as the father of the citrus industry in this area, as well as W.J. Murphy. But listen to these other crops that he so successfully raised. He did peaches, apricots, nectarines, grapes for raisins, peanuts, almonds, figs, plums, pears, sweet potatoes, and potatoes. Uh, so uh, you talk about a, a wonderful uh, farmer and very productive. And then also whenever he had a successful new crop that was uh, unusual for this area, he would put a big basket of it together and put it on the back of his horse and buggy and go all the way uh, into downtown Scottsdale to the Phoenix Herald newspaper and give them uh, the produce so that he could get publicity for how much of an opportunity people would have to come and farm in Scottsdale. So you talk about the, the quintessential PR man, that was our Winfield Scott. Also, as the next photo shows, in addition to all of those food crops, he grew alfalfa and barley and raised dairy cattle. And this uh, is a photo shown of his ranch. You can see Camelback Mountain in the background, just to give you an orientation. But uh, again, during most of the time that he was a farmer here, uh, all of the farming was done with horsepower rather than, uh, than engine power. But beyond being a farmer, he was the, the instigator and inspiration, along with Helen, for many of the, the things that we hold dear in Scottsdale today. As the next photo shows, one of his primary champion uh, areas was education. And of course, this applied to his wife, Helen, too, because, of course, she had been uh, trained as a school teacher. But within the first couple of years that they're living here, and as the, a few other settlers moved in, there were enough children here to start a school district. So Winfield Scott, along with the several other gentlemen in the area, started the Scottsdale Unified School District in 1896. And uh, later that year, in the early September, the town gathered and built the first little red, or the first wooden schoolhouse in Scottsdale. In fact, Winfield Scott is the man in the upper right hand, left hand corner in the, uh, in the hat. Uh, so they built the school. And as the next photo shows, as soon as the school was built, uh, that they built it on a Saturday and the very next day on Sunday, they gathered for an ecumenical worship service followed by a musical performance done by the children uh, located here in Scottsdale at the time. And again, just to orient yourself, there's Camelback Mountain in the background. And that wooden schoolhouse was pretty much adjacent to where the Little Red Schoolhouse is today. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, as the next photo shows, they were really a, um, a wonderful community supporting education. And within just a few years, uh, there were enough uh, students to really outgrow that wooden schoolhouse. So the, uh, the Scots, along with the other uh, members of the school board, um, Mr. Tate and Mr. Titus, uh, had organized the first school bond issue in, eight, in 1909 to raise money for a permanent a brick schoolhouse. Uh, and Helen Scott at the time uh, was very supportive of women being able to vote. Again, this was before nationally women could vote, but in the Arizona territory, women could vote in school board elections. And so Helen went around and gathered up the women uh, in town and the men also went to vote and the school bond passed unanimously and they raised $5,000 to build what we now affectionately call the Little Red Schoolhouse. And it uh, was dedicated, as I mentioned earlier, on 
Winfield Scott's birthday in on two, uh, February 26, 1910. The, the community was really tight knit as the next uh, photo shows. The Scots, uh, I might say, were the neighbors that you always wanted. And again, the next photo uh, shows uh, how everybody gathered to celebrate uh, major events in Scottsdale. Winfield Scott, because he was a pastor uh, and very active as a Baptist minister in Scottsdale and throughout Phoenix, uh, conducted many of the early wedding ceremonies. This is the wedding ceremony of the piano teacher, Helen Smith, and her husband, Walter, uh, in 1903, and the Scots are uh, just to the left of the Smiths there. But they celebrated so many things, weddings and picnics and holidays together. And the, the, the Scots were certainly the neighbors that you always wish you had, uh, wonderful people. Again, another industry that he started as the next photo shows is that Scott was really a visionary and saw that with our wonderful dry climate, that this would be a great place not only as a tourism destination, but as a health, uh, health and wellness area. And long before we ever had a hospital, they, the Scots began uh, welcoming people that had lung ailments and arthritis to come and spend the winter on their property and encourage some of the other early settlers to do the same. So there are across the street neighbors, in other words, on the northwest corner of Indian School and Scottsdale Road, there are neighbors, the Underhills opened the first uh, health camp and guest ranch in Scottsdale called Oasis Villa, and they opened that in the very late 19 or 1890s. So that really, with the, with the Scots urging, launched both uh, our health care and our tourism industries in Scottsdale as something that we rely on as our top two industries today. Another area that the Scots were really known for as patrons, as the next photo shows, is they were great patrons of the arts. Uh, they personally uh, welcomed our very first artist to town in 1909 when Marjorie Thomas arrived with her mother and brother from Boston. They had come out here because her brother was suffering from tuberculosis. And Marjorie just wasn't sure if she'd be able to crack into the art market here because we were kind of remote and out in the middle of nowhere. And there were, even in Phoenix, there weren't any art galleries or art museums at the time. So Winfield Scott introduced her to his beloved army mule, Old Maud, which was the town's mascot, and commissioned her to paint Old Maud. Well, fast forward about 50, 60 years later as the next photo shows. Indeed, Marjorie Thomas painted Old Maud and in 1969 gifted her oil painting of Old Maud to the city of Scottsdale's then new public art collection. And here she's shown with then mayor Bud Timms as she donated the, her painting of Old Maud, the Scots mule uh, to the city. Again, as I mentioned, uh, the city, uh, the community, although it was very small, less than uh, 50 people, were very tight knit. And as the, out, uh, the next photo shows, people in Scottsdale led by the Scots loved outdoor adventures and really set a tone for us being an environmental community and a community that loves and, and respects our outdoors. Here, they're having a picnic uh, in the hole in the rock, uh, but so many other outdoor adventures. And I might mention that all of these all the picnics featured lemonade only because the Scots were leaders in the temperance movement and gave a new meaning to the Word, this is a dry climate because we had no alcohol then in Scottsdale. The next photo would show 
that another part that, of uh, Scott's leadership was that as a veteran, uh, he was a very patriotic person and encouraged his fellow Scottsdale residents to not only be patriotic as this uh, photo from George Washington's birthday in February 1906 shows, but to also really get involved in community service. And he actually provided a, a great uh, role model for that. Scott served on the Board of Regents of the Arizona Territory and was president of the University of Arizona. And he also served several terms as an, a territorial legislator in the new capital in uh, downtown Phoenix. And as Marsha may be telling you in a few moments, he, he continued, that is Scott continued to be involved as a leader in veterans affairs as well. Regrettably, we lost this wonderful inspiration and the father of so many of our wonderful institutions in Scottsdale when he passed away in October, 1910. But many of his legacies continue today. And if you're interested in seeing quickly a few of his uh, uh, monuments, if you will, let me just show you a couple of quick pictures. The next photo shows uh, a wonderful sculpture made out of the very olive trees that Scott had planted during his lifetime as windbreaks for his farm. And this uh, particular uh, image of his head was done by local sculptor Bruce Law in the early 1980s and not only became uh, a treasured monument at the Scottsdale Historical Museum and at the library, but was given to prominent authors in the local area uh, as, a, as a testament to their uh, wonderful authorship. And I believe our next speaker actually uh, earned one of those awards. Uh, the next photo shows that uh, one of the early sculptors that uh, sculptures, a full length uh, sculpture that was done of, of uh, Winfield Scott is located in the Scottsdale Financial Center. It was done by local sculptor Buck McCain and was uh, erected in the 1980s. Uh, in the courtyard of the uh, right there at the financial center, which is located on the site of the Scott's original homestead at uh, Scottsdale and Indian School Road. The next very prominent sculptor that usually serves as the backdrop for this very Founders Day event was dedicated in May 2007. And this was the sculpture of, uh, done by Georgian Tognani. And it shows Winfield Scott and Helen, who's sitting on top of the mule Old Maud. And this was actually a sculpture that was paid for by contributions uh, and funds raised by a community effort and is now an important piece of the Scottsdale Public Art Program. And what's interesting is George Ann Tognani, the sculptor, uh, as the next photo shows, based this sculpture on one of the earliest photos that we have of the Scots in Scottsdale. This photo was taken sometime in the early 1900s. And I'll draw your attention to there's a shadow on Helen Scott's skirt. And this is something that Bruce and I puzzled about for many years. And finally, we found an article uh, in the in early Scottsdale Progress newspaper that identified that shadow as being uh, a, a fellow pastor and friend of Winfield Scott's, Werner Vanderhoof. So now we know who that mystery man is um, in the shadows. Another wonderful tribute to uh, Scott's legacy is in the next uh, newspaper clipping. And that is in 2011, during uh, the run up to, Scott, to the Arizona a centennial, uh, the, some of the remaining olive trees that Winfield Scott planted that are still on 2nd Street were honored as witness trees uh, as part of the centennial uh, celebration. And there's a plaque on uh, near some of those trees uh, saluting them as witness trees. In other words, they were still standing at the time of of Arizona's statehood, which occurred, of course, in 1912. 
And then, as I mentioned, uh, in this next photo shows another uh, wonderful legacy that bears Winfield Scott's name is the local chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, the Winfield Scott chapter. And this photo was actually taken just a week ago today when they, uh, the chapter members were presenting a check to help fund uh, a planned memorial behind City Hall that will honor uh, those uh, men and women who have fallen during wartime uh, that were actually Scottsdale residents and members of the military in many of our past wars. So we look forward to having that memorial, which certainly uh, I'm sure our Winfield Scott would be very proud of. And the fact that his uh, namesake DAR chapter uh, did much of the contributions. And last but not least, my, uh, my final photo here would show, uh, again, uh, this is Mayor Lane presenting a thank you tribute to the founder of this very Founders Day event, uh, Roberta Pilcher, and we certainly thank her for continuing this wonderful tradition of honoring our founder, Winfield Scott, and his amazing wife, Helen. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we treasure the memory of all the things that, that Roberta Pilcher did for the community. And I also would be remiss, and I'm sure I'm thanking, uh, and that's the end of the photos, but I have to show this, this book this is the final tribute to uh, Scottsdale, Winfield Scott, and that is Dick Lynch, a prominent historian, did copious amounts of research in Winfield Scott's life. And I'm sure that Marshall and Bruce and I and every other person interested in Scottsdale history couldn't live without this, this Bible about Scott's life. Uh, so if you haven't read that, uh, check it out. And gosh, if you do read it, you'll know what we'll talk about from now on, because this is a major source of our materials. So now I'm, I know you've all been waiting to hear for our, our keynote speaker every year, and that's our beloved uh, Arizona official state historian, uh, Marsh Trimble. And we've known Marsh for years as a history teacher at Coronado High School, as a history uh, professor at uh, Scottsdale Community College. He's been... Uh, a wonderful balladeer, entertainer, and folk singer throughout Scottsdale, and has just been such a friend and, uh, and also an author of many, many books about Arizona history. But important to the topic of today is the fact that he's a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, and I am so proud to introduce my friend, Marsh Trimble. Marshall? Thank you, Joan. Uh, it's good to be here again. Um, I, I had all kinds of plans this year before the pandemic. Uh, I was going to bring the original um, uh, members of the 126th uh, as they looked at today at Gettysburg on that day in 1863, but a lot of them are not, we're not up to facing the pandemic and couldn't come. So uh, if you'll just bear with me, we'll We'll, maybe we can get them out here next year. <laughs> it's something I've always wanted to do for Scottsdale. But um, I, uh, uh, I, I've always been fascinated by Scott because he was, he was uh, uh, most of all, because of his, he, he was a war hero. Uh, out on the battlefield, the man, was, the man was unstoppable. And you think, this is a chaplain. Uh, this, is, this is a preacher, man, this is a Baptist preacher. I grew up around those people. And uh, uh, I don't think any of them would even pick up a gun, I don't know. But uh, boy, uh, Mr. Scott sure did. And, uh, and he handled it well. He was brave, uh, brave in battle and, um, and brave and, and just great, a great man in peace. But uh, I wanted to really wouldn't want to talk about the battle, uh, his battle wars and things like that. He did that a few years ago. And uh, I was trying to think of something new today. And I thought, well, what was his affiliation? How did he get into this chaplain business? Uh, and uh, and uh, I just uh, so I, I assigned that one to myself this year. And I hope you like it. I don't have any fancy pictures to show you. Uh, you just have to look at me and, and my, my, my library and my office here because uh, that's all I got to show you today. But Winfield Scott served his church 
without hesitation uh, during those years after the Civil War, after he came home, and he was in constant pain from his battle wounds. Um, the frequent uprooting of his family, uh, the reduction in salary, along with having uh, to rely year after year on the vote of boards and committees and, and so forth uh, for his salary, it was beginning to wear thin on him. And so um, once again, he, uh, he dutifully gathered, he always did what his duty was, whether it was the church or, or the military. And uh, he gathered his family to go to Reno, uh, Reno, Nevada, and um, rescue another church that was in trouble. And uh, he was always doing that, traveling around the country, making lots of friends along the way that would help him later. But uh, this is what he, this is what he, this is the man, he, this is the kind of man he was. And um, so it was June 1881, though, he decided he was going to uh, change careers uh, at this point in his life. And um, he made an application uh, to the Secretary of War, Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, the son of you-know-who, and um, become a chaplain in the United States Army. Um, it was a coveted position um, among the clergy uh, who, who thought it was a, because it was a secure government post and, uh, uh, and, and he was paid only two, $2 $2,200 a year. But um, it doesn't seem to, that wouldn't go a long ways today. It might buy you uh, one night in a hotel, motel in, uh, in, in Scottsdale today. But um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was difficult to obtain a position like this too, because uh, there were only 34 positions in the entire United States, 34 chaplain positions. Uh, uh, that was it. And um, the, um, uh, the, the there, the only way to get into this outfit was to have uh, uh, somebody die or resign or retire and uh, open up one, open up, up, up open up, a, uh, provide an opening for, for to get a, pr a presidential appointment. Well, um, he decided to go for it and um, he needed more than a few good uh, uh, credentials to secure an appointment. Uh, and he started out by calling on the goodwill uh, at his disposal to, to gain a place in the system. And it crossed the country uh, in his mission work, uh, Kansas, the Northwest, and, and he had a lot of friends uh, he could call on, and he did. Um, and a surprising number possessed um, a considerable in political influence. And at his request, they came to his aid. Uh, course, and as United States Senator John Miller of California, a Republican, and I wanted to mention, uh, because um, uh, I was told many years ago, probably by Joan, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, Reverend Scott uh, uh, probably could have had a much brighter political career had he been a Democrat. But he was he was a he was a Republican in the in the Civil War on the North Side. That was, and and the Republicans were in power in Washington. So he, he did have a lot of Republican friends. Um, but in Arizona, uh, had he been a Democrat, uh, he might have been governor. You never know what what he might have achieved. And he did serve in the legislature. But that helped and that helped him a lot. But it was still a lot of things he could have done had he been a Democrat. You know how politics is today. Uh, not today, of course. But uh, it was politics back then was was uh, was uh, was politics. And uh, but anyway, he uh, he got Senator uh, John P. Jones, a Republican from Nevada. Uh, he seconded Miller's efforts and work behind the scenes. Just did a great job to gains work up support from several other senators. Uh, even some were Democrats, believe it or not. Uh, one was, especially one, one noted one was Francis uh, M. Cockrell, a former Confederate officer <laughs> from uh, Missouri. So it just shows uh, he could cross the line uh, uh, because of the kind of man he was. And in addition to the politicians, uh, Scott received endorsements from non-political friends uh, and uh, colleagues as well, uh, including the men of the 126 New York volunteers um, who he served as, uh, as an officer in during the Civil War and fought with them at Harper's Ferry and Gettysburg at Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, as Joan mentioned, and, and, um, and Spotsylvania, where he took the serious ba uh, battle wound. And uh, they, they, they signed a big petition for him, uh, uh, supporting him, 
And Scott was uh, also a member of several GAR, that's Grand Army of the Republic. That, that was the Northern, uh, the U Union Army. And um, had a lot of, he was belonged to a couple of chapters that he gained a lot of friends and, and uh, attention from them for the good work he did. And uh, they were, they made some of his strongest recommendations to, uh, uh, to, to, for this appointment. Unfortunately for Scott, um, uh, there were no vacancies available. Uh, did all this work and all this politicking and um, his application was put on file. Well, he didn't let any grass grow under his feet uh, until an opening occurred. He would remain pastor of the church in Reno while he continued seeking endorsements uh, around the country. And um, uh, he, helped, uh, he helped pay off the debt that the Reno church had gotten itself into. And he, he was a man who loved music. And, um, and he, uh, got the, he got the church back to, back to music again. Um, he took some time off to preach at uh, Denver during this, during this time. Uh, and, and Leavenworth, he had uh, built churches in both places. And as Joan mentioned, uh, there, I don't want to, I don't, oh, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say uh, what, what town was named for him back there, but uh, uh, in, in Kansas, and, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to play favorites on this trivia game that kind of, uh, uh, Bruce has got going on here. But um, anyway, uh, there was a town name for him in Kansas. And um, uh, he took some time off to preach at these every place along the way. It seemed like everywhere he'd go, there were demands on him uh, to preach a sermon. Uh, so the guy must have been one great speaker, one great orator. Uh, and orator, uh, there were, there, and this was an age of great orators. And uh, Scott must have been a champion among them. Um, fi finally, an opening developed, and uh, 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 President Chester Arthur sent his name to the Senate for confirmation, and, um, and it, that was no trouble. He, went, he just flew through the confirmation, and on July, July 27th, 1882, the Reverend Dr. Winfield Scott was about to embark on a, on a new career. He would be stationed. He didn't come to Arizona right away. Uh, he'd be stationed at several bases in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and, um, and in 1885, he began four years of service at the Angel Island in San Francisco Bay. And during that time, it was in mid-February of 1888, um, uh, his life was going to change in a ways he could not imagine, I guess. He was invited to Phoenix by a group of civic and business leaders to spend a week here in the Salt River Valley. And by this time, Scott was known um, throughout the nation and uh, as a man of honor, honesty, and integrity. And um, the young city of Phoenix was growing. Um, it was just a few years old. And uh, in, in July of 1887, the Southern Pacific Railroad extended a branch line from Maricopa uh, down, down south of here, south of the Gila River uh, to Phoenix, linking it with the Southern Pacific Transcontinental Railroad. And eight years later, the Santa Fe, Prescott, and Phoenix Railroad uh, would construct to Phoenix, to connect Phoenix, I should say, with the Northern Transcontinental Line at my hometown of Ash Fork. Uh, when I don't claim Scottsdale as my hometown, I claim Scotts uh, Ash Fork, uh, and uh, I get royalties in both places. By 1885, W.J. Murphy and his work crews had completed the 40-mile-long uh, Arizona Canal from Granite Reef Dam uh, up on the salt uh, down all the way across the New River. And um, the follow we always say New River is such a new river, it doesn't even have water in it yet. Um, and anyway, the following year, Phoenix would become the permanent capital city of Arizona. Scott noted at the time the population in Phoenix was uh, five, five or 6,000, he commented. Uh, but uh, he was here in the winter time. It went to about half that <laughs> during the uh, uh, during the, shall we say the warmer months of uh, uh, of the year. Uh, but Phoenix at the time was lighted by gas. Boy, it was a city on the move, and um, traversed by a mule-drawn streetcar, uh, seven hotels, boarding houses, two ice plants, um, one of the most important industries in Phoenix at the time and 20 real estate dealers and uh, 19 uh, retail liquor uh, uh, establishments. That's a, that's a polite word for saloons. 
and uh, 18 attorneys. The Salt River Valley was for Scott. It was for, it was love at first sight. Uh, and in 1885, as luck would have it for him, uh, he was posted to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I don't know if you've ever been to Fort Huachuca, but it's at a great climate, one of the finest climates uh, you can find uh, anywhere. And um, some of the some of the military bases I was stationed on, uh, it was, uh, uh, we'd, we'd love to have been to a place like Fort Huachuca. Every time I go there, I thought, what well, I get stuck, stuck here somewhere instead of some desert. But um, anyway, um, uh, I digress. But uh, um, what was I going to say? Oh, they, then uh, I, I, Scott returned to the valley in June for an extended visit, and uh, this time he made he he made a vac a long, an extended vacation out of it just to get to know the Salt River Valley. Uh, they gave him time to study uh, the geography of the area. Um, he noticed the extensive irrigation system of canals, ditches, dry climate, fertile soil, and um, compared to the, he compared it to the Nile River Valley in Egypt. And he believed that citrus and other fruit raising industries could be profitable. And a good thing about it, a, a positive thing about it for the Valley of the Sun, it was two days to the east closer than California. And... Um, then one day, venturing about 10 miles northeast of Phoenix, just south of the Arizona Canal uh, that I mentioned a while ago of W.J. Murphy's project, um, uh, he found his utopia. And on July 22nd, 1888, uh, an agent for Scott made a down payment of 50 cents uh, an acre. Uh, and as, uh, it, 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 as you heard a while ago, um, uh, and uh, it was... $2.50 an acre for about 160 acres of land under that Desert Land Act. And um, you got uh, Section 23, and it was bounded on Scottsdale Road, by Scottsdale Road on the west, uh, Hayden Road on the east, Indian School Road on the south, and Chaparral Road on the north. And um, in late January, 1893, Scott, now retired from the Army, planted 2,000 orange trees, thus becoming, thus becoming the father of Arizona's five C's, citrus. A year later, Albert Utley made plans to set states uh, to, uh, to subdivide, can't, get, can't say that word. I got my nose fixed, now my mouth doesn't work sometimes. And um, 40 acres just south of Scott's, uh, uh, Scott's land north of Indian School Road there. And uh, the town site was temporarily called Orangedale. Um, and then a, 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 um, uh, there was some talk about calling it Utleyville. Dick Lynch used to tell this story uh, a lot when he was uh, lecturing to some of my Arizona classes. And he would, he would say, uh, uh, Utley vetoed that himself. Uh, and so I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, but sometime between February and August um, of that same year, uh, the town decided to pay a tribute to the man who made it all possible, and um, they named it Scottsdale. And as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here, if you, even if I can't see you personally. I, I, I turn on by live audiences, and uh, uh, I had uh, Jane's smiling, smiling face over there, and, uh, uh, and um, I, um, I was able to uh, light me up just a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, like I say, uh, it's, it's always good to celebrate the birthday, even if we can't share it in person. And I'm always apologizing for talking too long because the chicken gets cold. And I guess we're not going to worry about the chicken today, are we? So I'll turn it back over to you and um, we will, uh, um, Joan, yeah, you're on again. <laughs> Joan, you're on mute. Do we have any lip readers out there? <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag here. Oh, Marsh, thank you so much. And Bruce, thank you so much. We are so lucky to have such wonderful storytellers and to have such rich material about our founder, uh, Winfield Scott. And again, thanks to Dick Lynch and his mentor at ASU, Bill Phillips. Uh, who used to be one of our frequent speakers when we had this uh, program many years ago uh, to relate our wonderful founder's history. So before we end uh, with a little bit uh, of an update on the trivia contest, I wanna remind you that even though we're under some unusual conditions this year uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there's still a, quite a few ways you can safely explore and celebrate Scottsdale history. Remember, the Scottsdale Museum of the West is open, and I, I know Marsha and I certainly uh, recommend that you visit the Museum of the West, but also from uh, there are several other places. Uh, there are books and publications and all kinds of Scottsdale history items that you can browse in the uh, relatively new Scottsdale Heritage Connection Messenger Research uh, Room at Civic Center Library. Everything from high school yearbooks to books about Scottsdale history and many other things uh, there at the Civic Center Library. And from the, the uh, confines of your own home, you can go on the library's website and look at over 10,000 digital images, many of those that you've seen today, as well as listen to and see oral histories from some of these very uh, prominent history makers that we've had in Scottsdale. And this uh, collaboration uh, of, uh, that provided those 10,000 images and oral histories is a collaboration between the historical society and the library. And again, it's uh, uh, available to you 24 hours a day on the library's website. And we also thank uh, the Scottsdale Video Network, uh, as well as the City of Scottsdale and the Library for uploading many uh, history talks, some of which Bruce and I have done and many other people have done uh, and pre-recorded uh, that are available on YouTube or on the city's uh, video channel. Uh, so you're able to watch uh, history programs we all look forward to the day that the Little Red Schoolhouse, the historical museum will be open again, stand by. And in the meantime, you can certainly tour the, the historic uh, train cars, depots, and the museum at the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park. You can visit uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright, Talies and West area in Scottsdale. You can see the World War II Stearman on display at Scottsdale Airport. You can view the many pieces of public art, many of which tell the story of Scottsdale history and on and on. So don't think that because we have to be safe and maybe we can't have as many in-person events this year that there still aren't many ways that you can enjoy Scottsdale history. So on that note, let me turn it back to Bruce to let you uh, know the update on uh, how we're going to do the trivia contest. And I want to wish you all a happy Founders Day and we hope to see you all in person next year. So Bruce, if you'll just conclude by letting us know about the, the trivia contest. And thanks again, Marsh and Bruce, and to all of you who have joined us today. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Joan. Just as a reminder, the questions were, what two cities are named after Winfield Scott and how much did Winfield Scott pay for his land in 1888? If you know those, put those into the Q&A and we'll be selecting uh, five winners and we'll be notifying you by email. Let's go over to that slide. Okay. And one last thing before we, we end this, when you leave this meeting, you're gonna get a link. It's gonna say, would you like to participate in a survey? And that's questions that we're asking for how to make 
this an even better presentation in the future and getting your input on today's presentation. We'd greatly appreciate it if you just take three minutes and fill that out. It's just like seven or eight questions. So Joan, I think we're, we're ready. Once people start putting in their answers in the Q&A, we will pick out our winners and we'll let them know by email. Great. Well, from Marsh and Bruce and myself, we wish you a happy Founders Day and a happy Winfield Scott birthday and a big salute to his life partner, Helen Scott. Uh, we couldn't have been uh, the community that we are today, the beautiful community, uh, the one that Herb Drinkwater, who often people said looked like Winfield Scott, often called the greatest city on earth. So again, and go out and enjoy a beautiful Scottsdale day. And we hope to see you in person next year for the Winfield Scott Founders Day event.